Hey, let's begin in prayer. Father God, we come today to meet with you. We need you. Every one of us here. And so we pray that you would speak to us. Now speak through me, Lord. People don't need to hear from me. But speak to us by your Holy Spirit, through your Son, Jesus Christ. And by the time we're done, may everyone here say, boy, am I glad I was here. I've met with God. In Jesus' name, amen. We live in a post-Christian culture. By that I mean when you walk down the street, you can't assume that the person on your right or your left is a Christian. You can't assume that uh, people at your school or your place of work or the leaders of our country are making decisions based on a Christian worldview. Our nation gave up years ago on the notion that there's a God who created everything based uh, right and wrong based on his holy character. So instead of making decisions based on what is right, who's to say what's right, we make decisions today for what works. Because they're, when, you, when you talk to somebody, you, you don't say to them, uh, figure out what, what the right thing to do. You say, do what seems best to you. Because there are no consequences for right and wrong anymore. Into this culture of moral uncertainty, the Apostle Paul writes, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Paul says, don't kid yourself. Every choice has a consequence. It's striking that we read these words in the book of Galatians. Galatians is the New Testament's Emancipation Proclamation. It's the book that tells us uh, that there are, the, the, the Bible can be summed up in two words, law and gospel. Law tells us that, uh, what God's demands are and that God's standards are so high no one can reach God, reach heaven, reach a reconciled relationship with God by keeping the law. So the gospel tells us God's deliverance, that he sent his son into the world, he led a perfect sinless life and died for your sins and mine. And if we accept his death on our behalf, we receive his grace. We are saved by grace, not by keeping the law. Yet Paul knows that human beings work like pendulums. He knows that Christians released from the law will tend toward libertarianism. We will think, well, if I'm not saved by keeping the law, I'm saved by grace. If I sin, I can just ask God to forgive me and there will be no consequences. Every choice has a consequence. I got my picture taken the other day. It wasn't by a photographer. It wasn't by one of our family members. It was by the Portland City Police. Pictures turned out so well that they sent me a copy of it. <laughs> and under the photo they said, this handsome dude was driving 12 miles per hour over the speed limit. Now, I could write them a note and say, you know, I was really in a hurry and uh, very important things to do, and I'm so sorry, would you forgive me? I mean, they would laugh all afternoon over that note. They could forgive me, but it doesn't undo the consequences that I still have to pay a fine. I want to share with you the laws of consequences. <clears throat> there are four of them that Paul spells out at the end of Galatians. Now, these are so important. When I share them with you, you'll say, oh, I knew that. We all know them. But we tend to forget them and tend not to live our lives by them. Here's the first one. We reap what we sow. 
Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Paul uses farming as an analogy. Farming is based on a fundamental law of nature. You reap what you sow. Plant a seed of wheat and you reap wheat. Plant a seed of corn and you reap corn. Pretty simple stuff. Paul says it's the same in the spiritual and moral realms. And it's true in a negative way and a positive way. Negatively, if we sow to please our sinful nature, we will reap destruction. A teacher asked her students, she said, I'll give you 30 seconds. Write down quickly all the kids in this classroom or the school that you hate. Some kids couldn't think of anybody. Maybe one name. Some had as long as 14 kids on their list. Well, the interesting thing is the kids with the longest lists of people they hated were also the ones most hated. Then the teacher says, all right, make another list. All the kids that you like in this class or the school. Same thing happened again. The kids with the longest list of kids they liked were the kids most liked. It's the law of consequences. You hate people and people will hate you. You like people and people will like you. To avoid consequences of destruction, you want to stay as far away from temptations as possible. A man wanted to hire a driver. He lived on this kind of high hill, and it was a narrow road with cliffs on the side, and he found three guys to interview, and he said, okay, I'm gonna, you're going to drive me to my house, and I'm going to ask you a question, and based on your answer, I'm going to select a driver. First one got to the top safely, and he said, how close can you get me to the edge of the cliff and still get me safely home. He says, I can get you within three feet. The man was impressed. Second guy drove him up, got him all the way, and he said, how close can you get me to the edge and still get me safely home? He says, I can get you within two feet. He was doubly impressed. Third guy drove him up safely, and he says, how close can you get me to the edge and still get me home safely? He says, I will stay as far away from the edge as possible. He says, you've got the job. If you've got a problem with pornography, you want to stay as far away from that temptation as possible. If you've got a problem with overdrinking, you want to stay as far away from situations where you'll be tempted to overdo it as possible. Solomon knew plenty of temptation. He writes, let your gaze look straight ahead. It's like he's saying, put blinders on. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. You stay as far away from temptation as possible. On the positive side, if we sow to please the Spirit, we will reap life. Verse 8, whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. If we're sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, I talked about this last week. I dare say on an average day I get 20, maybe 30 promptings from the Holy Spirit. Do this. Listen up. The, 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 the question is not whether I'm going to get promptings, it's what I'm going to do with them. Am I going to ignore them or listen to them and obey? If we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we'll develop the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. If we sow to the Spirit by doing things like reading the Bible, maybe you would use our journals to give you something to read, to think about that we're going to be talking about. Joining a community group. Coming to church, we will reap life. Every choice has a consequence. The second law of consequences is we reap more than we sow. Every farmer understands this law. Plant a seed of corn and it will give you back a harvest plus interest. If you plant a seed of corn, it will deliver you you know, corn with hundreds of kernels. On average, when you plant a seed of corn, it will yield a stock with th two to three 
ears of corn, each which have five to six hundred kernels. So you sow one seed of corn and you get back somewhere between 1,000 and 1,800 kernels of corn. A farmer counts on this quantitative law. Otherwise, if you just planted a seed and you got a seed, farming would be a losing proposition because the rain washes away some seed, birds will eat some seed, uh, weeds will overtake some seed, or thorns will choke it out. Farmers depend on the fact that you harvest far more than you plant. What is true in farming is also true in the spiritual realm both positively and negatively. Positively, when we sow to please the Spirit, we reap far more than we sow. The Apostle Peter, clear leader of the band of 12 disciples, asked Jesus, he answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What will there be for us? If I commit my life to you, will there be a reward? And Jesus answers, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Jesus says, you commit your life to me and you'll get back a hundred times. It is the best decision you can make. It's the same with giving. God calls us to give back to him the first tenth of what we earn. You give him back the first tenth off the top. A lot of people die over that when they say, boy, if I do that, I'm not sure I can pay my bills. And so ultimately, be, ultimately, you do it based on whether you can believe God's promise. Jesus makes the promise. Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He says, you can't go wrong. I will give you back far more, maybe in financial blessings, maybe in uh, satisfaction of doing good and helping people. On the negative side, if we sow to please our sinful nature, we will reap a harvest of destruction. Worse than we sow. David writes, whoever digs a hole and scoops it out falls into the pit they have made. Do you remember Haman? Haman in the book of Esther hated Mordecai. He hated him so much that he devised a plan. He, he built a gallows at his, on his own property to hang Mordecai. And he went in with the plan to share it with the king. And that day just kind of unraveled for Haman. Everything went wrong. By the end of the day, the king wanted to lift up Mordecai and he wanted to get rid of Haman. And, and, his, and he said, does anybody know where there's a gallows? And the servant raised his hand. He says, hey, Haman just built one on his own property. So he hung that day on the gallows he built for someone else he hated. Solomon says in Proverbs 22, whoever sows injustice reaps injustice? No, you reap calamity. Hosea says they sow the wind and they reap the wind, right? No, you reap the whirlwind. What's my point? You do not just sow wind and reap wind you sow wind and reap a storm good and evil both increase with compound interest byron wrote little things things that prick penetrate and progressively poison unexpected things low-lying vines that rip tangle and eventually imprison the thorns which I have reaped are of the tree I planted. They have torn me and I bleed. I should have known what fruit would spring from such a seed. Every choice has a consequence. The third law of consequences is we reap in another season. Verse 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest. Paul says you will reap at a proper time. Every farmer understands this principle. The, print, the farmer doesn't plant wheat one day and expect to harvest it the next. He plants wheat in the fall and the roots begin to spread and then during the winter it lies semi-dormant and the, the, wheat, uh, the roots spread even further. And then it heads out in the spring and he harvests it in the summer. 
A farmer plants corn in the late spring. Once the danger of frost is passed and the land has become friable, and then he expects to harvest it late summer. Failure to understand the delay between choices and consequences is the undoing of many people. Sometimes we think, I know what I'm doing is not what the Bible teaches. I know it's probably not in line with what Jesus would want me to do, but it doesn't matter. I'm being blessed anyway. Solomon writes, when the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, people's hearts are filled with schemes to do wrong. When we do things that are wrong but face no consequences, we think we're getting away with it. But eventually the consequences come. Solomon goes on. Although a wicked person who commits a hundred crimes may live a long life, long time, I know that it will be, go better for those who fear God, who are reverent before him. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. He says eventually it pays to do good, to obey God, and it does not pay to disobey God and do evil. One of the reasons consequences do not come immediately after our choices is because God is patient. He's giving us time to repent. Peter writes, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some count understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Realizing we reap in another season should cause us to want to play the movie forward of our lives. When we make choices, okay, if I keep doing this, what's going to be likely to happen years down the road? I know a man who was happily married. I think he was happily married. One day he decided to take a pretty young girl from work out for a drink. It was no big deal, he said. He was only looking at the immediate consequences. He didn't foresee that she would lure him into a relationship and he would fall in love with her and they would have an affair and they would end up ending his marriage in an ugly divorce and the angry wife would turn his kids against him. Then years later, as an older gentleman with a middle-aged woman, she would be leaving him for someone her own age. It all happened. We need to learn to play the movie forward. There's a positive application of this principle that we reap in another season. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest. Paul says, don't become weary in doing good. Keep at it. Stay at it. Keep obeying God. It will pay. The rewards may not come immediately, but they will come. Why does God say that we should not become weary in doing good? It's because he knows we will become weary. I called Jory, this is years ago, middle of the day one day to see how her day was going. Hi, honey. She said, I want to sell Mark. <laughs> I said, what? I want to sell Mark. Now, Mark was just about two at the time, cute little kid. This picture is probably a few years older, but, uh, you know, just hyperactive, just su such a cute kid. But he had gotten into the pantry, he'd found the granola, the sugar, the honey, spread it all over the floor. He'd found a marking pen written all over the wall. She says, I want to sell Mark. <laughs> she was weary. You can get weary. You pray for a child to come to Christ and nothing seems to happen. You pray for a baby or an adoption and nothing seems to happen. You're still not pregnant. You pray for promotion and your boss doesn't even appear to notice who you are. You're struggling in your marriage and you say, I'm too tired to fight for my marriage. 
you're battling an addiction, you say, I'm too tired to fight this addiction. When you give in to weariness, you lose your strength. I'm not asking you to not feel weary. You will feel, feel weary. I'm asking you not to give in to it. David was anointed king of Israel when he was a teenager. Not long after that, uh, the Philistines came to war against Israel and they put forward their giant uh, warrior, Goliath, nine feet tall, taller than Rick. Just this huge guy and nobody wanted to fight him. Everyone was afraid except David. He went out and fought him. God gave him the victory. He became a hero overnight. He was invited by Saul to serve in the palace. He was up and coming, a mover and shaker. Then Saul became jealous of David. One day at dinner, he threw his spear at him. David had to duck. And he fled the house. He knew from then on he could not be anywhere near Saul. Saul chased him around the countryside for years. 600 men came to David and said, we're with you. And they became mighty men. They fought battles of victory all and with all the countries around Israel. They were so popular. And so Saul hated him all the more. One day we read that they came home to their city and it was burned to the ground, destroyed. And all their wives and children had been captured and all their possessions. And the scripture says they sat down and they wept until they could weep no more. They were weary. Well, David could have given in to weariness and that would have been the end of the story of him as a king. But the Bible says he dug in his heels and he encouraged himself in the Lord. Isaiah says, he strengthens the weary, yet those who wait on the Lord shall mount up with wings like eagles, so they shall run and not grow weary. He says, I've come too far. It had been 13 years since he was anointed as king and he still wasn't king. He says, I've come too far to give up now. And so he encouraged his men in the Lord and they went after their enemies and they captured, they overtook them and they recaptured all their wives and children and their possessions. But do you know what? Three days later, Saul was killed in battle and David assumed the throne. His greatest breakthrough came right after his deepest weariness. He didn't let the weariness in. Let us not become weary, but believe God's promise. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Which leads to one more law of consequences. We reap a full harvest only if we do not give up. If a farmer gives up a month before harvest, the crop dies. The weeds take it over. January 3rd, 1978, the Trailblazers hosted the Chicago Bulls at where we used to play, the Memorial Coliseum. It was the year after we had won our only NBA championship. We had a great team. 13 seconds were left and we were down 90 to 86. We could have given up. Most of the fans had left the exits disgusted. Ten seconds to go, Walton shuffled the ball to Lucas and he scored. Then on the inbound play, Lionel Hall and stole it and scored. The Bulls brought the ball down for one last shot. With two seconds to go, Twardzik stole it, passed it to Hall and he scored. Blazers 92, Bulls 90. They scored ten, uh, six points in ten seconds. If they kept up that rate, they would have scored 1,708 points. Troy and I watched a movie about a, a, a girl and a guy, their brother and sister. They were fleeing a, I think it was a, a stepfather who was abusing them. And they went with a guide across the central African desert. They didn't have enough water. Sun was beating on their backs and they were trying to get to this town. And they finally just ran out of steam and they 
And they just lay down to die. Turns out they were just one knoll away from the oasis where they're going, the city to which they were fleeing. But fortunately, people found them and saved them. They gave up too soon. The Apostle Paul shares four laws of consequences. Now that you've heard them, you say, I knew those all before I got here. Read them with me. We reap what we sow. We reap more than we sow. We reap in another season we reap a full harvest only if we do not give up every choice has a consequence the problem is even though we know that our choices have consequences we know that if we sow to our flesh we're going to get into trouble it's going to be bad we do it anyway and even though we know we should not grow weary in doing good, we do give up. And God knew that about us. So he sent his son into the world to live a perfect sinless life, to die for all our sinful choices. If we thank Jesus for dying for us and commit our lives to him, God forgives us and gives us his Holy Spirit. Now get this, this is so important. Daily, we have to say, God, I know I'm prone to make sinful choices, bad choices. I know I'm prone to give up and get weary. Help me to depend on your Holy Spirit today to make good choices. Because I know every choice, every choice has a consequence. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For teaching us through the Apostle Paul today. His amazing words that he ends the book of Galatians with. Do not grow weary in doing good. If you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, the place to begin would be by committing your life to Christ. Say, boy, I see it. I tend to make bad choices. Just kind of, you can guess every time that's what I'm going to do. Forgive me, God. Thank you for dying for me, Jesus. Would you come into my life? Put your Holy Spirit in me. Begin to change me. You can do that right now. Or you've made a commitment to Christ and you basically have to say the same thing. I'm prone to make choices to the flesh. It's so tempting, so easy. I do it all the time. Forgive me. And Lord, I get weary. I'm weary today. Help me not become weary in doing good and not give up. Why don't you pray right now if you'd like to make some commitment to Christ. I'll give you a few seconds. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.